The production of this show is made possible by the support of viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and become a subscriber. Welcome to Conversations That Matter. Today we're talking about mental health, addiction, and homelessness, and its relationship with the police. Joining me now is Mike Veneer. Mike, who's our guest today and what's their perspective on this? Yeah, today we have Chief Jim Chu. He's the Chief Constable, of course, too, of the Vancouver Police Department. He's been with the Vancouver Police 35 years, seven last years as, as Chief. Also, interestingly, just finished up his term as the President of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. One of the issues that he highlighted in his tenure was the issue of policing and mental health. A little known fact that in Vancouver here, 20% uh, of the time, police are the mental health responder of first resort. So they're responding, in other words, to serious mental health issues uh, as the first agency uh, responsible. And it's an increasing challenge not only here, but all across Canada. Mental health authorities and chiefs of police say it's a skyrocketing issue in Canada. And so Chief Chu can talk about it not only from his perspective, and they're doing some innovative things here in Vancouver, by the way, uh, really trying to train police officers to not just be in a responsive mode, but a proactive mode. They have almost 200 individuals they call clients that teams of police officers are actually reaching out in a proactive manner, working collaboratively with these individuals and other agencies to try to prevent the police from having to be that, that, that first responder, if you will, on, on mental health issues. And of course, we see periodically in the news the tragic stories of individuals who are killed or seriously injured in police related mental health incidents and that's really what Chief Chu talks about wanting to prevent. Uh, Chief Chu also points out that you you get erratic behavior by people who are facing mental health or addiction challenges and if there is any one issue that puts the public at risk for a random act this is probably it. Well, that, that's right. And, you know, here in Vancouver, we may not necessarily think that right off the top of our head because, of course, we have the situation of the downtown east side where we have a significantly large population of individuals in one isolated area where we say, oh, that's where the mental health is, that's where the drug addiction is. In fact, we know, and Chief Chu will say, that these issues of mental health and addiction are everywhere uh, here in Vancouver and in Canada. One of the things that he's promoting as a national leader uh, of policing is a standardized approach and training regime for police officers to help them have better skills as it relates to mental health issues. It seems odd to say that he has a holistic view of all of this because traditionally we think of the police as being there for law enforcement. It's a fascinating conversation that we had with him here on October the 6th at Lassie Gal. Uh, let's go to that conversation in just a moment. Thanks for joining me on this uh, complex issue around, and, and it really is intertwined, uh, mental health, addiction, homelessness. Uh, what has happened that it's wound up uh, reaching a point where people who are facing those challenges in life are now finding that the police are, in many cases, their first responder or their first line of, uh, of help? Well, this has been the problem that's been developing for decades. And it all started when people were deinstitutionalized out of Riverview. And uh, while they came out of Riverview, that same uh, policy happened in many other jurisdictions in North America, if not the world. The thing is, when people were taken out of the institutions, and, and for many people that was the right move, the idea was they would have supports in the community. And what we have seen is there haven't been enough supports. Uh, they need help in terms of getting good housing, they need help in getting uh, medication on a regular basis. So uh, a lot of people that left Riverview were left to their own devices and where they end up were the most low income housing stock was available which is the downtown east side of Vancouver. And unfortunately that area is also rife with drug addiction and drug dealers. So somebody that's mentally ill uh, ended up meeting their friendly neighborhood drug dealer and now you've got the dual problem of mental illness and drug addiction. And whether they're able to retain their homes or not, uh, and that they weren't, then you've got the, the triple problem of homelessness, addiction, and mental illness. Well, I guess you can go the other way too. Somebody who is addicted can wind up having mental health challenges as a result of their addiction. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, and so it, it, it becomes confusing, uh, you know, which came first. Right. Well, there's a large cohort of people that have been studied by the medical profession 
and uh, because of the addiction to some very uh, um, serious and uh, harmful drugs like crystal meth, um, it's actually created uh, what they call holes in the brain that uh, now have physical characteristics that contribute to their inability to function normally. Okay, we wound up in this situation because there was uh, good intentions uh, at one level, um, and then is, the, is it the system has let them down? Well, it's what you want to invest to help people in the community. And uh, if you have the right housing, that's one thing. But if you have what is called supportive housing, that's more important. So just put somebody in, the, in a rooming house, um, the Regent or the Balmoral in downtown Vancouver, uh, those, uh, uh, th that type of housing is, is not very good for someone that's trying to recover or trying to maintain control over a, a mental illness. And if they don't have the right workers and support functions, then their uh, mental illness can be much worse. Um, you almost need to physically visit certain people and make sure they're taking the medication or else that person will spiral into a crisis and when they reach a crisis, then the police end up dealing with it. And when you wind up starting to deal with somebody who is uh, challenged with uh, you know, mental health issue, how does it change the nature of your job? Well, our goal when we go to any situation, and especially when it might involve the tenor of violence, is to resolve the situation without using force. We don't want to uh, use force. In fact, we train our officers very carefully. Our first uh, um, line is presence and dialogue. And uh, so when we get the phone calls, it's, it's from a citizen who's concerned. Maybe uh, uh, somebody is uh, disrupting them as their next door neighbor or they are uh, causing problems at a business. And now we have to end up dealing with it. And if the person experiencing the crisis does not understand or does not respond to our communications, then unfortunately sometimes we do have to use force. And we don't want to use force. And also, when we go to those calls, sometimes that person's committed a criminal offense. They might have assaulted a passerby or a store owner or a neighbor. And now we're pressing charges and we're criminalizing behavior that should be dealt with in the mental health system, not the criminal justice system. So what do you have to do to prepare your officers to be uh, appropriately uh, you know, ready for those kinds of situations because now you're starting to deal with uh, somebody who's not just saying okay you're here I understand uh, they could act in ways that are unpredictable how do yeah. you prepare for that? Well there's only so much we can do um, we have decided uh, or four years ago we decided that we will have a mandatory crisis intervention training sorry, crisis intervention and de-escalation training for all officers. It's a 40-hour program. It's kind of modeled after what was brought in the Memphis Police Department, and it's called the Memphis Model. Um, we have, you know, subject matter experts that come in, and also people with lived experience who have experienced mental health uh, challenges in their own lives to help the officers understand how to respond to people. And it's not, you know, yelling louder or talking more sternly. It's quite often being softer in tone or even backing out of a situation if somebody has that sort of crisis. But as, as trained police officers, we only do so much. We're not psychiatrists, we're not psychiatric nurses, um, but we have put in numerous partnership programs with the mental health professionals to jointly respond to those calls as well. Well, you're working with Vancouver Coastal Health, as I understand. Yeah, it's a great partnership. So there's two programs that we really like in terms of partnerships with Vancouver Coastal Health. One is assertive community treatment. There's five teams where we have officers as part of a multidisciplinary team, social workers, psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, and they have a client uh, uh, caseload. And these clients that the ACT team serves, they have less times that they're going to be in contact with the criminal justice system, less times that they're going to enter into the hospital emergency system. And uh, the best thing about it, they all have better lives because that's what we want. We want people to live peacefully and have a good life. Mm -hmm. We also have another program brought in the last year called Assertive Outreach Team, which is a more proactive uh, type of uh, team. It's a smaller group of people. It's usually a police officer and a, and a psych nurse. And they get to uh, go, they look at a case list and they go, okay, here's somebody that uh, we should be checking up on. Um, so we're gonna be out there talking to them, double checking they're taking the medication. And we're trying to prevent the crisis from happening in the first place by visiting these people in their own homes. But is that the role of the police? 
That is an interesting question. Uh, if you asked me five years ago or 10 years ago, I'd say, well, that's not the role of the police, that's the role of the health system. But here's what my thinking on it is. We want to keep the public safe. The public means innocent bystanders, citizens, and people with mental illness. We don't want them to reach a point of crisis because if they do, then we're investigating it. We're, we've got victims of crime. We've got people that are potentially hurt. So in order to prevent that crime, we have to front load our efforts and participate in these teams so that we don't have those crises from happening in the first place. Yeah, but how do you prepare for that? Because I'm sure that when you put your budget together and when you're looking at the allocation of your resources, you're there to come in and de-escalate or uh, uh, you know, contain a situation. Well, you're now moving into the preventative uh, measure of policing. Is that the changing role of policing in, in Vancouver? Th that's a better investment uh, for our officer time. If a crisis call happens, city, say somebody's barricaded, then you have the whole building surrounded, then you call in the negotiators, you call in the emergency response team, that call could go eight, nine hours, and then afterwards you document the whole call and you're putting the uh, witness statements together, Think of the, and then it's down to the criminal justice system. Think of the cost of a crisis call, mm -hmm. not to mention that somebody may be hurt. Now, factor in the, uh, now compare that with our efforts to prevent those from happening. Mm -hmm. If that's a half hour visit where we go with the social worker or go with the psych nurse to visit a client to make sure they're taking their medication and living properly, then that may be worth it. And I agree with you, but I'm sure that at some level, uh, the decision was made uh, to change the way that people with mental health issues uh, are housed and, uh, and cared for, and that they have slipped many of them have slipped through the cracks and wound up now in a situation where you become their uh, their first responder yeah. um, and that was never intended so how do you make it work within you know the structure of your 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 budget your organization um, so that you're not just saying okay well there we're there to prop up another uh, agency that can't uh, meet the need well I like the way you put that do you mm -hmm. think somebody one day said, we're going to take all these people that are in the health system and we're going to put them on the street and when they have a crisis, the police will go take the call? Uh, I don't think they anyone said... Didn't. We're gonna, no, they yeah, probably they, didn't. But yeah. that is the de facto uh, result of whatever policy decisions were made in terms of deinstitutionalization and not investing in community supports. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I back up again to, you know, we're supposed to protect the public and, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, we had uh, several high-profile calls where innocent people were uh, subject to attack, uh, and uh, that involved a, a person suffering a mental health crisis. But let me, I, I don't want to stigmatize the mentally ill and say they're dangerous. Most people that with mental illness live fine and don't harm others. Mm -hmm. But they themselves are likely to be victims of crime. In fact, you're 23 more times likely to be a victim of a violent crime if we have apprehended you under the Mental Health Act within the past year. So why? What because happens? of your own behavior uh, and depending where you might live, you may be the victim of a property crime because people are going to steal your things, but more likely someone's going to uh, exact some violent revenge against you. I, I know of one person in downtown east side who um, when he is acting in, in a rational manner, is very, very annoying. And you've got some unsavory types from downtown East Side who take liberties with that and, and, and assault him and, and, and uh, harm him when he's really a victim of his, his own illness. Because they become irritated by his behavior. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's right. So they're at risk. The people with mental illness are at risk too. Mm -hmm. So it all comes back to let's do whatever we can to prevent the crisis from happening in the first place. And so as a police department, uh, not only do we want to prevent people from being victims of crime, but we also want to protect other people from being victims who you know, may encounter someone with a mental health crisis. And uh, there were some high profile calls that we dealt with about two years ago. Mm -hmm. One involved uh, somebody who was released from a, a, a psychiatric ward and attacked three elderly women on the streets. We had another case where somebody went berserk in an apartment building in downtown Vancouver. We had another situation where uh, a man uh, who uh, had finished his uh, criminal sentence uh, for 
uh, a violent assault, went berserk in a 7-Eleven and uh, took a knife and uh, stabbed another in a, uh, person in the, in the uh, store. Mm -hmm. So uh, I feel uncomfortable talking about these stories because I don't want to stigmatize the mentally ill. But unfortunately, those incidents are real and they happen. And they're random acts of violence. They're random, that's right. Which and is the thing that I think f uh, makes people the most fearful. Uh -huh. Yeah, we had another one, uh, and not, not all horrific cases. Uh, we had a situation in a public library where uh, during story time, uh, somebody went up and interrupted the story time and, uh, and, and hit the, the, the reader of the story with a book. You know, so it wasn't a serious assault, but it was clearly a case of uh, a random attack because somebody had a mental health crisis. So what do we do? How do we change this? Because uh, you can't just sort of turn around and say to somebody else, well, you have to take more responsibility. Um, well, we, as the police department, um, we think we're, we have a responsibility to be advocates for a safer community. So uh, the Vancouver Police Board, who um, are the governing authority for the police department, uh, under the leadership of the mayor, who's chair of the police board, um, have been meeting with the Vancouver Coastal Health Board. And there's a joint letter that was written to the province um, asking for five things. Uh, one was more secure beds, because there are some people that should not be in the community. I mean, institution, deinstitutionalization worked for a lot of people, but I think they went too far. I mean, the person I was describing who's so annoying that he's, he's beat up all the time, I don't think he's functioning well in the community. Um, so secure beds. We also want support for people in dedicated housing, and for people that are supported in the community. Like some people are not living in a, in a dedicated unit, but they might have like their own uh, basement suite somewhere. Um, so those are the people that need support. We wanted to start up this um, response team called the of Outreach Team. And uh, they were helpful in, in terms of uh, um, putting resources in. So we have those teams working with the police and, and mm -hmm. the health professionals. And uh, the last thing is when we take people to St. Paul's Hospital, we've been asking for a more streamlined process. Um, Right now, you're brought in uh, under the Mental Health Act, which is you're um, a danger to yourself or others and suffering from apparent mental disorder. And we're doing about eight or nine of those a day. Mm -hmm. And we don't want people to go into the emergency ward and, and have it become a revolving door where there's not the right experts to treat you. But also, the wait time is, is very, very troubling for us as well because we've got two police officers waiting and the next thing you know, the triage nurse sees them and then the resident sees them and then finally the psychiatrist sees them, right? And we're mm. trying to change that process. So we've asked for um, a dedicated response center, a crisis unit at St. Paul's Hospital, where uh, the mental health uh, uh, apprehensions can come directly in and see the experts directly without going to the regular emergency room rigmarole. The two kinds of pushbacks that I've heard in response to that are, uh, well, the police just want everybody to be locked up. And I go, I don't know that that is the case. And you don't seem to be uh, suggesting that at all. But there does need to be a change. Yeah, um, as I said, deinstitutionalization worked for a lot of people. But for some people, it didn't work. And for those people where it didn't work, where can they go? Uh, right now, unfortunately, they're going to another type of institution called a jail. Right. So how many beds do we need? We did an estimate in terms of uh, the numbers of people, especially in the downtown east side, um, and uh, we came up with 300. Now, if the number's 200, if the number's 400, we'll let the other experts determine that. But based on the numbers of people that we felt uh, needed that and talking to some of the experts in the system, we came up with 300. So you've been able to identify specific people that you think need an extra level of, of attention. Um, by advocating for certain people, we've seen them lead better lives. Uh, there's one person that we uh, wrote about in our, we had a, a report that we wrote about right. in 2007 called Loss in Transition. Yes. How a lack of capacity in the system is failing Vancouver's mentally ill. We also wrote about it again in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then 2013, we put a third report together. So we've been pointing the, we've been shining the light on this issue for a long time. Um, I'm not sure we need to shine a light because anyone that walks around Vancouver <laughs> can encounter people that ha have uh, um, aberrant behavior. The, but anyway, this one person we talked about in 2007, we finally got him some secure housing in uh, about 2012. So it took us about four or five years to get him that secure housing, and he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. In fact, the institution he's in, uh, he edits the uh, newsletter, he writes poetry. But that wasn't him when he was on the streets. 
when he's on the streets, uh, he would be uh, um, just uh, extremely difficult to handle, and people would be terrified of him, and he'd be just uh, acting in such a, 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 a dangerous manner. It was frightening. Mm -hmm. And we would have to arrest him. He was in a jail cell so many times. But when, even when he's in the jail cell, what he would do, he, he, would, he would cover himself up with feces. Uh, that's the kind of thing he would do. I think that person's okay on the streets, whereas now he's, he's in, a, in an institution. And we're not talking uh, create one flew of the cuckoo's nest, a <laughs> sterile environment. Uh, right now there's some very good thinking in terms of humane living conditions, but with some element of supervision so that people take the medication they need and, and get the support they need. So the other pushback is, well, that costs money. Uh, what do you say to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's finite resources, and uh, I also believe that if you put them all into the criminal justice system, that creates lots of costs that uh, aren't really going to helping that person battle either their addiction or their mental illness. Uh, and then it's a matter of how important this is. And uh, when we pointed out last year that there's some innocent people in Vancouver who were subject to random attacks, uh, I think that got the attention of a lot of uh, decision makers that we need to put more into this. And when we put that report together uh, in November 2013, um, the health minister did respond. And, and there were some decisions made that allocated more funding in this area. Do you see the trend changing then? Or are we still at the, okay, this is a good idea stage? I think it's going in the right direction. And uh, I believe that uh, they are looking for ways to help increase the funding. Um, I think the situation is better than last year. Whether it's moving fast enough or not, changing fast enough, you know, things take time and uh, uh, or at least going in the right direction. Hmm. All right. Well, let's hope that uh, we can find a solution that works for everyone, including your members. Thank you very much. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Stu. Thanks.